Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Art Cast. This is a show where a couple of friends get together and take on various storytelling topics that cross one's path when you go on this it, adventure of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Droz. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I am a user experience designer, and I do some coaching related to product creation and development. Uh, I'm an interactive maker, and you know what? I'm a teaching artist, too. Hey, he said it. He said it. He is a teaching artist because mm -hmm. he's an artist who teaches. <laughs> So this is the show where a couple teaching artists get together and talk about visual storytelling. Um, how you doing? <laughs> I am doing okay. Um, juggling a variety of things. Um, those who follow me in different personal channels, go tune into that for other personal news. So, but mm. uh, yeah, I'm here. I love doing this project, and it's uh, it's awesome to think through this stuff, right? I mean, you we we think hard about this in a way where it's it's like um, it's okay to have a hard time thinking hard about stuff, and then to leave that leave a trail of that and look back on it, and then somehow let that inform you and encourage you, and and somehow um, help with your ongoing development personally and professionally to to make stuff, right? To tell stories and and um and like that's well, like we we do this in a way that it's you know uh i think it's pretty obvious i suppose if we were flexing and screaming we would have been doing it already yeah yeah and this would be no surprise to anybody who's followed the show for a long time but i mean actually it, it is worth like i like the idea of modeling this reinvestigation of our approach every once in a while, just because this is something we talked about in like a lot of recent episodes is like checking in on yourself and evaluating your motivations and your approach and everything. Mm. And I just got an email from a friend recently where they were telling me, you know, I kind of want to get out of this space where I've been occupying, where I'm being asked to speak authoritatively about subjects. I want to get into some messy areas where I don't know the answer. And it's really more the fun of figuring it out. And I'm like, I feel that. I felt that for about nine years now. <laughs> I love being in this space of like, one of my favorite moments in the classroom when I'm teaching comics classes is when I get to say, I don't know, what do we think about that? And like opening the doors to everybody weighing in on this idea and like getting perspectives and listening to, because I might know, I might have like a pat response to that moment, but this is an opportunity to test it. And find out if I if I really do have a pat response, or if my pat response is based on a bunch of assumptions that come from my own personal experience. Let's hear from other people, right? Ah, oh, that's that's rich. That's the moment where like things actually get exciting and interesting. Um, and I, I think I think we're like teeing up the topic this week too. It's like this idea of like. <laughs> Of, of like knowing, just knowing this is what we do. That's all. But I'm like, I look at that and go like, ooh, that sounds kind of dull. That sounds like, what are we going to do tomorrow then? The same? Oh, oh, I was kind of hoping we'd have like an adventure on this thing. So, um, it's, yeah. um, in dealing with it, uh, it's, there's a, there's a utility to knowing enough mm -hmm. to, to, to go ahead. But at the same time, it's, it's like it, you, you can, um, if, if you, if you shut off the curiosity at that utility of just knowing enough, then there's probably a lot more things that you could use to like adapt a, a thing. Like I've worked in a lot of places where like, I'm really comfortable in just doing some, you know, some, some, some exploration, some, uh, some anthropology on the people working there, the audiences that, that they serve and who was in the, in the industry. And you, you do this investigation and it can seem like, like willing to, to explore that much and have some intentionality. Like we hope we learn some things and then this guides how we learn, but it's not that comfortable for everybody. Like I've noticed that, like I want to include whoever's uncomfortable uncom to come on, come on along and, and let's try this, but not everyone's comfortable with being um, curious and that sort of flexible to borrow from tons of tools. It's nice to narrow down the tools sometimes and say, I'm just using those five and I'm, I'm good. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, because yes, you're talking about like it depends on the dynamic of the moment too. Because there's also like the minimum viable products. Like, what, okay, well, we also just have to ship something today, you know. Or I have a syllabus that I have to honor in order to meet my obligations to my hosting organization. You know, we can get into weird areas, we can get into the weeds here, but we also have an objective to accomplish. So, okay, we'll investigate this as best we can, and then we got to move on to the next thing. Or Right. Mm -hmm. Limit what our choices are. Every project has constraints, right? All of us as individuals, any of the endeavors we engage on. Yeah, it's good to acknowledge those constraints. And I think sometimes engaging with stuff in a curious way, it it's it can be uncomfortable in a variety of variety of different ways because of the the overwhelmingness and all that. And and um, uh, but right. I guess, so I guess we're modeling how we're going to approach talking about this. <laughs> All right. Well then let's just go ahead and do it. Let's get in there and, you know. And now we're in the episode. <laughs> the music, for those who listen to the audio, that signals that we are in to the first part of the discussion. For everybody who watches the video, that was an opportunity to see me and Rob dance around a little bit. Um, (laughs) so I thought it would be going to this idea of, um, what does curiosity look like? And Hmm. I thought um, a modeling exercise would be something that's actually happening in my life right now in that I've decided Rob to build a computer from not scratch, but to like assemble my own new computer. Uh, which I mm. I haven't done in literally 20 years. It was it was uh, it was summer of 2000 that I put together my first PC on my own, um, and I really enjoyed that experience. In, in it, there was an enormous amount of leveling up that went into that. Um, but like there was something we can dig into this a little bit more deeply. But there's something really satisfying about Taylor making something that that services the needs that I specifically had, um, and so when I started, I I put one night's work into it. I've got like a little bit farther to go before I can like boot it up and test it out. But I was talking with a friend. I was talking with a friend about it. And they were like, you must be some kind of super genius. You know? And I was like, well, (laughs) that's kind. But no, (laughs) because you just get the parts and then you just be careful when you put it together. And then it just, I'm not like making RAM chips, right? I'm not like assembling a hard drive. (laughs) I'm not writing the operating system for this thing right um this isn't sure but there is it's interesting (laughs) you do have like it's it's um you have built a level of comfort and skill in the context uh, to be willing to um do do something that could seem to be pretty risky i mean assembling electronic components and uh, even choosing them right so like you can get overwhelmed by like okay so i i guess i do want to build a pc (laughs) Woohoo! <laughs> now yeah. the world is an avalanche of PC parts. How do I filter all these things? It's <laughs> kind of kind of wild. You know, you um, know I mean, it, on that track, I mean, I had to go to Micro Center, uh, which we have in Columbus, and uh, I went to the the make your own PC section, which I was just like, wow, this still exists. Because like I remember twenty years ago when I built my first PC, it's like I went to like Radio Shack. Uh, where's Radio Shack now? I don't know. Do we have those anymore? Um, there, there were a lot of uh, Fry's Electronics was another place that I went to in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but like walking into like this gigantic, it was like a wing of the building was all stuff to build your own PC. And I'm like, that's awesome that this still exists, you know. But yes, if I didn't have any previous experience or previous research done, that would be a sea of noise. That would be like watching TV static. It would be that incomprehensible, I can imagine. But so, so that can be, the, that whole adventure can begin by having, by modifying in a small way, uh, like a PC you ha- already have, right? And all of a sudden you get, a, you know, you get, get more confident and, and get a comfort level to say like, oh, I could take, I could get all the parts and, and do this. Mm-hmm. So, so I, you know, I can understand your friend being like, hey, whoa, that's, that's pretty alien and, and uh, yeah. scary. Yeah. You it, it, are kind of magical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see that, but it's it just it's it's funny to me because I I'm so accustomed 
to existing in a space where it's like, ah, oh, I have so much to learn from everybody around me all the time, right? Like, so to hear those words, I'm like, what are you talking about? Get out of here. But yes, <laughs> I, that, that's another, I got to do my perspective taking. That's a topic. Yeah, that is a topic. Um, mm-hmm. Everybody write that down. Remind us later. <laughs> we got to talk about that. We got to dig into that one. Whatever's going on in Jersey's uh, psychosis. Uh, no, but I could see somebody also recoiling from it from the perspective of like, well, why not just buy a new computer? Because like they have them. I've seen them. I've been to the Apple store. I've been to the Microsoft store. It's like they got good, better, best. I just pick the one that I want and I get it. You know, you go to Amazon.com and like I do a search for computer. Boom. There's a whole bunch that are just made. Why would I, why would I go out through all that trouble? You know? Um, and so I thought like looking in first starting out with like, okay, well, why do we like, what leads us to curiosity? Cause like, as I was thinking about the topic for myself, I was like, you know, a lot of times I'm not just like somebody who's like always inspired by everything around me. I don't walk through the woods going like, Oh, the clover. It makes me think of a poem, you know? I'm not like that attuned to like always like going off on whimsical paths with my mind. A lot of times this is informed by some frustration in my life. Necessity being the mother of invention to use that old expression, right? It's like I notice something that's frustrating me, it's irritating me. I was like, there's got to be a better way, you know? <laughs> so, and, and then I, and I look around, and this is something we've documented on the show for the past almost decade is... I look around and I see everybody's got a solution, but there's no one solution that answers all the problems that I have, right? Like like when Apple first rolled out the iPad, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be amazing for art. And they're like, but why would you want to use a pencil? Hmm? What's wrong with you? Why would you do that? You know. And then I remember when the Galaxy Note 10.1 came out, which we t- talked about on the show, and I'm like, is it good for art? And I'm going to all these reviews and people are like, it's great for light word processing and chatting with your friends, but uh, why would you use Do you a need pen? to sign a PDF? Mm. <laughs> Right. We've got your back. And like, yeah. but what's the line quality? What's the pressure sensitivity like? It's pretty good for doing some light computing. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. You know, it's like nobody, <laughs> nobody, nobody was 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 ever addressing it from the perspective of where I was standing, right? And that that's what was happening in 2000 when I was like, I want to do these things with my computer. Um, I want to make art, and then going back to 2000, to tell that story as a modeling exercise is that. Okay, this was the year 2000, everybody. YouTube wasn't around yet. Streaming services didn't exist yet. You had cable TV, you had VHS, and you had DVDs, and that was pretty much it. And then because of my my personal interests and hobbies are, you know, old cartoons and sometimes esoteric old cartoons. Not I say esoteric just because it's like I know I'm I'm fascinated with stuff that like the the general public isn't quite as interested in like the mighty Orbots season one is that does that come up in conversation at you know mixed company parties not often and i'm not saying this as any kind of value judgment it's just i understand it's a bit of a niche area of interest which means the people who are making dvd collections aren't collecting mighty Orbots. there's no money in it uh cable companies they got a, a lot of programming to put on besides an out of the way esoteric cartoon series right um so I decided, hey, I'm going to make my own DVDs, i.e. video CDs, which were a thing back then. <laughs> and so I started, and, I'm, and if I put them on CD, then I can, I'll have my box sets that nobody else is making, right? Well, I had a computer at the time, and I'm like, well, if I can get like an external video processing card or like a video encoder plugs in via USB, I can grab the signal from the cable TV when the cartoons are airing, and then I can encode them on my computer. Well, reading reviews, it's like, well, it works, but it's not great because it's an external device and it's only so powerful. You're really better off with an internal device. Boom, switch was flipped. Okay, maybe I need to build my own PC so I can do this thing that I'm interested in doing. And that led me down, right? The point of, there was a point of frustration. It's a point of like, I can't, I can't archive this stuff the way I want to archive it or I can't purchase archived versions of stuff the way I want it. Nobody's offering that. The devices that I have can't perform the way I need it to. I need to build something custom to do this very specific thing. Uh, there's a, this is a, another way to describe this topic is uh, feeling the comfort and confidence to build your own tools. Yeah. And that 
Uh, yeah. And I think it, it totally relates to curiosity. It relates to um, trust and comfort and uh, having the, I guess the context to, to, to give it a try, right? Because sometimes you could be mildly curious, but not enough to give it a go. Um, you could be curious enough where you, you happen to notice things, reading articles and PC magazines and websites occasionally, and then, and, and kind of conceiving of like, oh, sure, maybe I could do my own um, CD collection. But there's a certain threshold you cross where it's like, all right, I got, I have the idea and I feel confident enough in the concept and I'm going to move forward and all that kind of stuff. And it reminds me of, of working in situations when people and like myself or others are comfortable building our own tools or not comfortable building our own tools and like what's present or absent in each of those situations. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's, it's a pretty awesome thing as if you, you know, caring about making when you are confident enough to build your own tools to go forward to do a thing, which is also a trap. A lot of game developers would be saying like, ah, yeah, I love to build my own tools and never finish a game. And I understand this too. Uh, I yeah. have also worked through these kinds of things and, and uh, I get it, but somehow there's that the, sometimes it presents itself as a, as a worthwhile. Yeah. This is part of doing the bigger thing. I get somewhere faster, better because I'm willing to give this a try. So mm -hmm. um yeah. So you did all this research. Um, yeah. So it started, it started confident with confident along the way. Yeah, exactly. It started with an initial bit of research. It's like, is there an easy way to do this? Okay. External cards. Let's look at that. Okay. Well, whoa, now I got to start thinking about resolution. I got to start thinking about bit rate. I got to start thinking about what a USB two port can actually handle in terms of throughput and whatever. Like I'd never, never had to even think about this stuff before. Now I'm thinking about it. And so that builds up my confidence a little bit. Okay. I'm getting conversant and being able to compare these external cards. And then I'm realizing that, Oh, I'm never going to get the bit rate that I want, i.e., like you could think of it as resolution in terms of movement, right? You got your resolution in terms of the picture you see on the screen, but then you got resolution in terms of like how smooth and fluid is the movement, how much uh, in interpretation is happening between the movements when you see like those macro blocks on old, you know, compressed videos. Um, that's the best description I've heard of bit rate ever. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Never took a lesson. Wow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, and so like as I was researching this, I'm like, okay, they can do it, but it's not going to look that great. What's next? And then I kept in, in article after article and like there was like VCD forums, right? Like they're arguing over like <laughs> the difference between CDRW minus versus CDRW plus, which were two different uh, rewritable CD technologies. Um, so like there was that level. I'm like, oh, God, yeah. that's a whole nother thing I got to learn now. And I got to read all these like, you know, uh, think pieces by people in the VCD community about this. Um, and so like this slow acc uh, accruing of knowledge led to the fact of like, okay, it seems to me the best choice is going to be doing an internal thing, like building my own PC and, and putting an internal card in it. And actually, I think if I remember right, the f my first thought was like, I'm going to see if I can put this internal card in my existing computer. No, it's too old. It's not compatible. Damn. Okay. The easiest solution is not available to me to, in order to get to the bit rate and resolution that I want, right? So now I'm going to have to do some more research. And I guess if I were to characterize it, it's like the confidence was in that I had a target. I, I, I had defined what my end goal was in terms of I want this resolution. I want 320 by 480 or whatever it was, whatever like three by four aspect ratio was at that time. And I want it to be variable bit rate, this many kilobits per second. Okay, now that I know that's what I need, now I can start winnowing down to like, what are my choices in terms of, okay, that's the card that can do it. What motherboards is this card compatible with? Now I can start like this branching tree of decision-making process. Um, and in doing that, of course, my curiosity is being peaked along the way in terms of like, oh, well, I didn't know that this kind of RAM, I didn't know there was different kinds of RAM, right? Uh, and different kinds of RAM are going to get me different kinds of performance depending on what I want to do. Oh, different video cards can do different kinds of performance depending on what I want to do. Oh, this could actually have an effect on the way I make it. And then it starts like this, this snowball effect of um, the curiosity is being piqued by the uh, urgency of the research, right? I'm, I'm beginning to see how this could be connected to other, this could improve other facets of my life, of my work 
by knowing how to do this stuff. Mm. So it's it's a it's skill building. It's skill building. Yeah. 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 And really? and the connections to other areas of your life like I in my experience at least reveal themselves to you through the research that is driven by like I think I'm doing research about encoding cartoons onto PCDs, which by the way, this last year I just threw out a mess of them. So I'm like, oh, now I have them all on DVD because who knew they were actually going to put the Mighty Orbots on you know DVD uh, and, and Super Friends and all these other shows that I loved as a child, and now I have them. So it's like, okay, well, that was a lot of effort that was that maybe you could say it was wasted, but in researching that, it also led me down paths to learn other things about like how I can make it, it brings me to now where it's like I'm building this machine because I want to get better at doing video production for projects like lean into art and my other teaching work and so I come in with like a lot of uh I wouldn't say confidence but it's not fear it's not ambiguity and it's not I don't feel I don't feel nervous or hesitant about well, it. well I mean it's it's experience and expertise and it's uh and it, it's it accessible right so I will um, let's see, experience and expertise. I experienced this a little bit when going back and doing a huge update to a uh, guitar fretter classic. And I hadn't written a line of code of in Lua language in a couple of years. And I have, I hadn't done anything complex or super involved in, in, in Lua and maybe even a couple of years before that. So, uh, but at the same time, like the, this, you do a crew enough and so and 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 it gets buried somewhere in your in your memory like this experience and and the expertise so you you had these events where you applied these skills right that's kind of like experience to me seems like the story of the events and expertise seems to be seems to be the the application of of your capabilities and skills right and that you've you've you know built to do a thing and all of a sudden if, if you're like well if that's there um you know what a what a confidence boost because mm -hmm. yeah. you can draw back upon it. Yep. And even if it's immediately accessible or it will take a little bit of like uh, shaking off the rust and reacclimating a little bit, warming up, then, mm -hmm. then, you know, hopefully then you get more and more confident and ready to, to, uh, to tackle that thing. Or, or at least you have like a passing familiarity with it. Well, it's, it's, it's like the difference between here, here'd be a metaphor that I think maybe works is like when you, and this is coming from, again, from very recent experience, you move to a new city and you aren't as familiar with the map of the city. You don't have it mapped out in your head yet. And so your confidence level of getting from here to there, yes, I know we have Google Maps now, but even like in terms of like, well, are these one-way streets? Where do I park to get to this place? You know, it's like, I want to go get to this food truck, but like, is there parking over there? I don't remember. I don't know yet. And then you get more acclimated to the space. You go there a couple of times and now like your, your relationship with that journey is so different where it's like, okay, I think there's a parking space over on this street. I seem to remember that. Even if you don't have a perfect memory of it, your confidence in that there aren't going to be a whole lot of hiccups between you and doing the thing you want to do. Right. Um, Another example, going back 20 years, is we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I remember, do you remember a program called Adobe Image Ready, Rob? I do. Um, wasn't that about uh, converting formats? Right? It, 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 it was, was the one? Image oh, Ready? There was a one. What? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, there was another more obscure tool that like, you know, early days webmasters used, and I cannot remember the name of this tool, but it was, uh, it's going to come to me somewhere or feel free to throw it in the, in the chats or comments. But, uh, yes. Um, so you it, could make an image in an app and then you need to make it into a different, you know, it, format. It, it, like, it, you could take a Photoshop file and slice it up into pieces and it would build the HTML based on the slices that you do. That's to, what it did to build like a, essentially an HTML wireframe uh, that you could plug in the JPEGs for your website and you could do image rollovers. That was a big deal. Like you'd like just using layers, right? I was thinking of debabilizer. So, uh, um, versus, so that's, that's essentially save as, right? So all that whole program, which used to be a whole separate thing, got baked into every darn program because, you know, people figured out and developed and licensed all the algorithms to save into the different formats. But you're talking about taking an image and saying like, this gets to go to the web 
But first, I must turn it into an HTML table. But yes. I'm an artist. I don't, you know, I want to do and it visually. I and I don't, I look at an HTML file, and this is again 2000. And I'm like, I need to have a website. I'm going to launch a web comic in a couple of years, right? And so I'm like, I got to learn this stuff. I looked at HTML, I'm like, I, <laughs> you know, and it's a bunch of garbage gook. Only geniuses can do this. And then like Image Ready comes along, it's like, hey, you know how to use Photoshop. You just like use this knife tool and it makes an HTML table. You export it and it even like puts the paths to all the images. So you just put them in a directory and boom, you got a website. And like, I, and I'd made my first website was like a little Transformers website. It was called The Hub. And like it had like, um, like this matrixy kind of thing in the middle, like the, the Autobot Matrix leadership. And there were these drawers that you could like tap on. They would open up to show you different sections of the website. And they would like come out of the hub. And I remember I, I put that on the web and I shared it with a few friends. They're like, how, how did you do this? You know, like they're, they're making geo city sites. Right. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. You know, like I, I'm a web designer now, but then all of a sudden I wanted to do like, you know, I wanted to like build uh, an archive. I wanted to have, you know, um, a directory that pointed to individual pages in a comic. And it's like, Oh, Image ready isn't that awesome for that, you know? It's like I'm gonna I'm gonna have to learn HTML now, you know? And so now I'm on webmonkey.com and I'm reading articles and learning about different tags and I'm building my own HTML for the first time, which was very rudimentary and rough. Like the first webcomic I ever did was a never ending scroll of JPEGs. And then at the top and bottom were links to individual JPEG files, right? Like there was the directory, which was it and it was the colors I wanted it to be. You know, it was fine. It was functional. Yeah. You know, it did what I needed it to do. And so I then that, that meant that like when I want to do more ambitious things, like I'd like to have some animation on there. Okay. Well, there's this thing called Macromedia Flash. Okay. Well, I understand how HTML works. Let's learn how action scripting works. Right. You know, and so these th th these curiosities and these needs point you to other things that seem like if you were to say on paper, it's like, I'm a comic book artist and I've got a website. I've got a website for my web comic. You want to learn animation too? Why would I need to? I mean, I've got, you know, my, my, my I'm a comic book artist. I make static images and deliberate sequence. I don't need to know animation. Ah, but if you put some animation in there, here and there, it could make some like cool functionality on the website that would make it more pleasant and pleasurable to be there so people want to stick around and read more comics. Oh, okay. Well, there is a reason then. Boom, now I've got a reason to learn a new thing. So, again... <laughs> I don't know if I'm accurately or adequately describing this whole idea of what curiosity is, right? I, I don't think of it as something that exists in a vacuum. I think it's something that, that emerges out of being intentional in your art and being able to investigate and describe what it is that you're trying to do, establishing what does success look like. Um, I want people to read this comic. I want people to stay on this website. I want people to engage with my stuff. Yeah, I think you're describing maybe the, um, so a lot of times when, when we talk about curiosity, we, we think of it in, in sort of a, like a really brief context. It's a moment. And I think you could have curiosity as beyond like an emotion in a moment, and it could be a system. And so curiosity as a more systemic way of engaging at um, like your, again, your personal uh, development and your, your career and product development, it's, uh, they, they look a little bit different because it takes that moment into um, like a progression. Like that's what the system is. I don't mean something super complicated. It, like everyone can have a different way of how they engage with it and say like, oh, the curiosity is, is, is essentially a blip, a signal, something in the world that in that moment says, do I get to feed this into this ongoing pro uh, process of, of how I get stuff into the world or make a thing better or make a new kind of thing? And, and it, it can incrementally, you know, all of a sudden you, you realize, well, you have an interesting, you know, pile of experience and ex expertise that you've, you've built or, um, uh, and, and then like how that, uh, you're describing how it emerges to me, just, it gave me the, um, my aha was like, oh yeah, that's, that's like a system, right? Because it's, it's not just that um, initial recognition of, of uh, being having a hungry brain looking for uh, stimulating things and saying like, this is stimulating. Uh, 
but the the flavor has gone so quick, right? Okay, yeah, it's kind of like um, fruit stripe gum. Yeah, right? that's, I just thought of the exact same thing. That's the cl- the classic uh, over promise under deliver <laughs> thing in my head is fruit stripe gum. <laughs> yeah, um, I know I'm fruit stripe gum in some contexts, but like <laughs> anyway, nothing beats that amazing initial flavor that's gone in an instant. Yeah, it really is. A happy zebra. <laughs> every time you want another one don't um, you kid yes yeah <laughs> so um yeah. so i think you're teeing yeah, up curiosity emerging but yeah you're, you're, you're teeing up the next section i think which is talking oh. about like like how we think about curiosity and why it, it's important in our artistic journeys um and exploring this idea of like you know maybe maybe it's not part of your system um well, let's look at why it's part of our systems and see if it's at all useful to think about for anybody else. Um, what do you think? I, I think that sounds awesome. Let's okay. let's uh, let's go with her. All right. Well, we'll be back in about a minute and a half to talk about how curiosity is part of our systems and and like how it's you know how we think about it. Um, before we get there, we need to thank some people who make this show possible, and those are the people who support us on Patreon. Yes, Patreon.com. Slash lean into art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you believe in Rob and Jersey and what we do, you can help make this project sustainable by contributing as little as a dollar a month. And you can also do it as a one-time contribution. You just contribute once, avail yourself of the behind-the-scenes content, and then you know cancel the next month um, and come back whenever you have the discretionary funds to support the show. But I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on an ongoing basis. First up. Becca Hilburn, thank you, Becca, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Becca on Twitter and all social media at Natto Soup. And Chris Watkins, thank you for believing in us and what we do. It means a lot to us. And Catherine Sugru, thank you, Kat. You can find Kat on Twitter at Kat Sugru. That's the letter K, S O O G R O O. And Ash, oh, Ashley Knapp, thank you for believing in us and what we do and continue to support us. It means a lot to us. And Carrie Goble Billick, Thank you, Carrie. You can find Carrie on Twitter at Mushin Girl. You can join all of them at patreon.com slash leanatort where you will find all the shows we make as well as the extra leans, the shows we record monthly only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread. We can talk about whatever you want in a safe space with fellow leaners. And it also gets you access to the Patreon-only section of the Discord server, patreon.com slash leanatort. Thanks to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot to us. It really does. Thank you so much. Okay, I need to choose some kind of music uh, or sound to indicate that we are up oh, there. <laughs> Speaking of overpromise and underdeliver, <laughs> welcome Atari Pac Man. It's been it a also, while. Yeah, and also because we were talking about computers and 20 years ago, although that's more like 40 something odd years ago. Yeah. Um, now, let's start with. I'm going to like do a little devil's advocating. Um, you know, it's like I got my mastery. You know, I am cartoonist, teaching artist. I'm not computer manufacturer. I'm not live streamer. Um, I don't want to go into the sort of, um, you know, intellectual fallacy of like, well, if you're this, you're not that, right? It's like we could be lots of things. And, w- and, the, and the titles we use do not define the entire scope of who we are. We're more than that. But... I'm saying that like, hey, look, I, I have worked my whole life on this level of mastery. I don't need to be going down any rabbit holes right now. Thank you. I'm fine. You know, um, mm. you be a wizard over there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's a line and wizards do not cross. That's it. <laughs> We're focused on my job. And so let's see. What is what is that? What is that dynamic? Um, I mean, so what you're describing is trying to maintain a bubble of focus and safety, right? So, okay. What other, um, like pressures and context are you within working within to get that thing done? Is, is it a temporary thing to say, like, I need a force field against curiosity wizards, um, for the next week or month or something. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, and is, or is it forever? And, or is, is right. it a, kind of like, is it an event or is it a lifestyle? That's a question I like to ask myself. That's a, that, um, that is a very useful question too. 
Um, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, so honestly, because if it's a lifestyle, then okay. Right. I mean, I, I don't know if this, this isn't like a, an endeavor to try to say, let's recruit any, everyone who's not, not into that idea. <laughs> and, but, but like, I think a lot of us just get into situations where we're temporarily not into that idea, or we're trying to work into a situation where maybe curiosity and what you're describing, I mean, not maybe some factor of it is, is, is are elements of privilege that let you be in a space where it is safe to focus and have resources to act on this other thing that is has some level of risk right mm -hmm, but in order mm -hmm. to mitigate the risk you described putting in some effort to get some greater confidence through in your investigation and understanding getting conversant with this new thing and uh and then trying it out somewhere um yeah there's i think there's a lot of reason where you know, there that curiosity, uh, you might want to have a, you know, not have that in your way. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you circled that area that we call privilege because, like, that is some important context. In that, when I talk about these investigations that I went on early in my career, um, I didn't have children and I didn't have a ton of responsibility, right? I had a day job where I worked as a graphic designer for a, um, uh, what is it called? A, a real estate magazine, like house <laughs> listings. So it wasn't like intellectually taxing work. It's like make a grid of houses, make sure that the 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 um, file maker pro is associating the right photo with the right listing, right? It's like it wasn't like super complex work, and I wasn't like in charge. I didn't manage anybody. I showed up, I did my amount of designs for the day, and then I went home. So like I had the intellectual space to, and, and I had the time to do that kind of, you know, um, seeking, I guess. Um, hmm. and, and, and I had a partner who understood that like, okay, when he gets on one of these Jags, he's gonna, he's gonna dig hard. And, you know, like I, I'm married to a librarian who's, uh, you know, her, her profession is helping people find information. So like, I had a lot of things sort of like setting me up for success in that scenario. As I've gotten older and I've taken on more and more responsibility, I don't have a lot of bandwidth for new investigations, right? Unless it's directly, mm. unless I can directly justify, this is part of my job, right? Like you people who are paying me, I'm going to need this much runway to do some seeking and information gathering in order to figure out how to do this right. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a different scenario, right? And so like I, yes, I, I don't want anybody to read this as me finger wagging at people who are feeling those pressures. <laughs> oh yeah. I didn't, I don't think it reads as that. Okay. Um, it's just, I think it's, it, uh, you know, it's useful to, to, to characterize it um, with enough detail to know what kind of exploration um, it was instead of just having the lines of curious and incurious um, mm -hmm. because I mean, I've worked with plenty of folks who like who as a lifestyle, that's not their, their jam, right? There is a certain, path and and you can really you can encounter this and i think a lot of industries but for instance in software development so i i have found all kinds of squishy interconnections when um like uh you speaking of i don't know gonna, gonna try to weave a couple of different things in and not get us too far off the notes but like uh earlier in my career i was uh i was let's see I was a janitor in my, when I was about 18, 19 years old, figuring out what am I going to do next in my life? And then I realized it was going, I was going to make software and computer games and that my skills I learned as in from elementary school through my teenage years to a certain point still apply. Computers aren't like made of alien things. They still have logic and stuff, whatever. So I have all these things that started to gain, I gained confidence. And I started to pursue this other path that led into, you know, web making, you know, multimedia things and web development, all this stuff. And, uh, but all along the way, this, I, I've, I've, so I've worked with um, even, let's see, in forming my own businesses, but then especially getting into larger institutions where you have a lot of culture of specialization and even hyper-specialization. And that it can be totally functional and be appropriate in the right system. But then it can also, it can make other things really difficult. So uh, uh, as far as like, seeing the possibility of where we could go with, you know, doing new things, because of course, for me, it was, how do we engage in, in 
bring valuable um, capabilities and stuff to this audience who is now reaching the, our business through the in internet and websites, right? Because that just wasn't the thing before. And yet, anyway, so, and there's always these tech cycles that, yes, I'm talking about an ancient one, but they still exist. And you have battles like, now we only use frameworks. We don't learn CSS and HTML and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah. Anyway, there's always sides and optimizations and saying, well, we're set for this problem, not that one. We're, we're not, we don't have the comfort to stoke curiosity. We don't encourage it and all this kind of stuff. Even though like someone like me where I'm like, yeah, Sometimes broad brush is great because I see a lot of overlap between you folks who think in sets and you folks who, you know, enjoy genetic algorithms and you folks who, you know, are optimizing for network performance, whatever, like, because I listen to all of you anyway. Um, but here I am privileged guy, right. <laughs> no. Um, doing this kind of exploration, trying to find the connections and, uh, all that anyway. Well, okay, yeah, let's let's dig into that. Bring us back. You no, you you did not stray from the notes on this because this this points to something I was kind of hoping we get to talk about is this idea of like the, the headline I put over it is that versatility increases autonomy. And uh in the case the case that I'd make for that is is from my own experience is like I went through a period where I I considered myself a highly specialized person in that this is the very beginning of my journey into making comics. Um this is in the first like I would say four years of me making books and making copies of them and distributing them in some way, pop self publishing. Um, mm. And I define myself somewhat naively, but I mean, you have to start someplace. I was like, I'm a penciler. And what a penciler does is the penciler thinks about visual storytelling, big panel, small panel, close, far away, viewing angle, gesture, pose. I'm not thinking about line that much. I'm thinking about it to the extent that it defines the shapes that I'm, I'm drawing. I, I wouldn't have had the language for this when I was like 22, but, but like what I was, the, the process I was thinking through was like, I'm not thinking about lines any more than defining the shapes and the relationships between objects, but in terms of, uh, uh, displaying or rendering volume, lighting, texture, that's not my gig. That is for somebody else to figure out. I don't have that skill set, and I'm happy to defer it to somebody else. Now, I had a partner at the time who we were being published. Uh, this is very early on Antarctic Press publishing gig, and he fell so behind on the deadline that, like, it was impossible to finish it in time. And so, you know, the gig kind of fell off the, the rails and didn't, didn't happen. And I remember thinking, like, ooh, this is tough to have to depend on other people when I don't know how to manage people yet. I'm still a kid pretty much, right? Like my, my mental self-image was I'm, I'm a child, like pretending at being a grown up, right? Actually, in a lot of ways, I'm still that way. But, uh, <laughs> but it's a timeless feeling. Yeah, it really is. I, I, my mental image is still, I'm, tw I'm 12. But, um, but anyway, it's so like this whole idea of like having to depend on people, that's fragile. And that's going to require another kind of leveling up that I don't have yet. I better figure out how to do this myself. And I remember the day when I was like, I got to figure out how to ink, you know, I have to learn how to do this. And so that led me down a whole new investigation. I'm like, I'm going to look at inkers now. I'm going to try to like back, reverse engineer how they're doing what they're doing. What am I noticing about this? And that became um, the front rebirth. My first web comic was like me learning how to ink. No, I take it back. No, it was PPV, pay-per-view, 2002 my first mini series, the first three pages I inked quote unquote in pencil. And then I started using a pen. I started using a crow quill in that first issue. And that was me learning as I went. Um, and it was born out of the fact that like, okay, well, until I learn how to like really work well with people, <laughs> I'm gonna have to do this myself. Right. And like knowing how to do it means that I don't need to have an inker. So when I do work with an inker, I can enjoy it a lot more because now it's like, what do you what do you bring to the table? How do our voices harmonize? This is more of a playful jamming experience rather than me being like, I don't know what you got to do, but do what you got to do. You know, you be you over there with your ink pens. I'm going to be over here with my pencils. I don't need to know. You know, it's a mystery to me. You just make it happen. Um, but now I know and I and I can appreciate more what they're bringing to it when they're bringing something to it. Right. Um, that is so 
that's how a lot of my my career progression is that kind of thing because uh, of of being curious trying to you know uh falling in love with with problems that the audience was having but then also the people making the things and i really i know some folks that i've that i've worked with where where i've i've not done this right is i i would come off as um like a know-it-all right that's that that would be the that'd be messing it up doing it wrong and and uh i think overall i've avoided that but like um maybe just seeming like uh arrogant or fortunate or something where hey good for you you get to study all this stuff but i would i would uh let's see i would find a new boundary in the problem like um you like making these web this you know automating publication of websites and it's like, well, the technical problem, this is what the audience cares about. The people who manage the servers, these are the risks that they care about. Okay, well, if we build something that, that does that, but now it looks like this, it's not really ready for the people to use because when we try to get them, you know, get them to use it for the, their task, you know, so it, it, it does, it's not, um, it's it, sure, maybe the capabilities there, but it's, but it's not accessible. It's not usable. It needs to be relevant to the audience. And so all this sort of, I started building these, a lot of interviewing and understanding people in these different groups. And in some cases, being able to apply their skills on a rudimentary level. And in some cases I, I would get okay at it. Um, and then uh, I don't like, that's a, that's a thing too. So by, by studying the different things that are at the boundaries of what you're working on, you can be curious about the people who do those things. You could be curious about the thing itself and what makes it it and what shapes the people who work with it. Right. So people who work with databases and people who, you know, I don't know. And, and nowadays it's, you know, uh, it, um, what are you, well, let's see, what would be, uh, um, like graph stores and all this kind of stuff, big table stuff like you can do on all kinds of cloud platforms, but like it, it all still, it's, it's like, you create these concrete things that solve problems and people kind of, you know, come around that. But then there's other folks where it's like, yeah, that's not my day job. That's not what I only what I do, but it's starting to relate to what I do. And that's some, that meta skill is an interesting asset to have because it can lead to, well, investigating and mapping out bigger systems and understanding people and how we fit together to, to solve bigger problems. And that were, there was a chunk of my career where it's like, yeah, I was a user centered, um, um, engineer, then user-centered designer. And I thought, you know what, maybe I could just be a enterprise software architect. I don't know. But I saw all these different possibilities because yeah. of that curious investigation and stuff over time that, and I thought you were describing one of those benefits really well, Jersey. It's, it's like by learning the, that task of, of um, you know, the, the tools and the process of, of inking and appreciating like why an inker do, does what they do, all of a sudden it opens up a ton of possibilities where by understanding them, maybe you could manage a project where someone is, is an inker or at the very yeah. least collaborate with your, your fellow, you know, project people, your comrades and colleagues. That, that's exactly right. Like, so like one could, one could very easily point to, well, the benefit is that I don't need anybody now and I can operate as a one man band or whatever, one person band. True. But also Maybe. it means that now I know what I'm asking for when I team up with somebody. And you're right. Like, this is why I use that language. And I was talking about that story from my, my past is like this inker who fell behind. I didn't know how to manage the moment. Right. Because I didn't even know what I was asking for. Right. I'm like, like, just get it done. Just do it. Right. Anybody who wants to know what it was like to work with me in 1998, read Boulder and Fleet Mining for Trouble. It's at boulderandfleet.com. There's a character named Sapphire who is this green girl with um, she's a green stone girl with like crystal hair. And she's trying to manage this group of bandits. And she's constantly falling to pieces, trying to get them to sign on to her vision. And like I, I was totally just channeling everything I dislike about my younger self into that that character. Like, yeah, this is me when I'm being self righteous and being uptight and like really not like listening to the people around me and just be like, we have a project to do. You know, I'm being a strong leader by shouting. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, anyway, uh, but mm -hmm. but like, yeah. So now I have that perspective, right? So like when I'm working with an anchor, I know what I'm asking for and it's easier to have a discussion of, well, how do we make this as easy for you to do as possible? It's never going to be easy to do, but as easy as possible. 
Um, this, not to go off our notes again, but like the Super Comics Challenge game show that I developed, which I'm really proud of because I feel like it was me taking a lot of perspectives like, okay, well, I'm an artist who doesn't necessarily have a big Cintiq in their office. I'm an artist who maybe I just have like a, a Huion, like, you know, cheap uh, graphics tablet, or maybe I don't even have that. Maybe I just have a mouse. How could I get them to be able to participate? How do I make this, like, what's their experience going to be like engaging with this thing? Right. Um, you know, that, that perspective taking is, is powerful, right? Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's e like yeah. what defines the success of that endeavor is now um, it's just more robust. It's like you've woven more strands into the, the, the rope that ties that whole thing together. It's, it's um, yeah, it's a really useful practice. It's not that you needed you in order to do that too for that kind of curiosity you didn't have to go buy every one of those kinds of devices too right right Just, right like how did you explore that well I explored it from the perspective of <laughs> well <laughs> this came from a little bit of personal experience like the very first comic I ever half toned like like so I, this is before I learned computer coloring but I was I was toning in Photoshop I did it with a mouse I did it with a mouse and so and then then I got my first graphics tablet in two thousand three which was like a like a uh it was it wasn't a wacom it was like like what third party kind of thing um mm -hmm. and and so i had to learn that whole business of like oh, this is what it's like to draw here but have it happen on the screen that's weird you know i learned that skill and i've taught classes on this where i'm teaching young people how to use wacoms i've watched how they've experienced it and what what kind of things they've run into what's easier for them what's harder for them um so there's a lot of experience mm -hmm. for me to draw on um so, but no, I didn't have to go out and buy that stuff, but I did when I was evaluating, I guess this is, this is something I was talking about with Anne recently is having a clear sense of what I'm, this goes back to the very beginning of this episode. Um, having a clear sense of what I want to accomplish helps me filter out what tools I need to get there. And so when I was like, okay, I need a whiteboard piece of software that allows multiple people to draw in real time with whatever equipment they have handy. All they need is a laptop or an, in, in, maybe even a phone. Can they do it with a phone, right? And so now I can look at a whole bunch of different candidates. And I did, I tried out like uh, Google Jamboard, which is like, we, we have a lot to promise. And I was like, mm, Google Jamboard, if you're listening, you need to, you need to it, iterate on that product a little bit because like doing live drawing with multiple people is not the most intuitive and fun thing in the entire world. It's great for putting up photos and annotating them together. It's like, I guess if that's what your use case is, but like for artists to all jam together, not the best product, right? So, you know, that thinking about their perspectives of like, what does this look like to do it on a phone? What does this look like to do it on a laptop? What does this look like to do it on a, 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 a Cintiq? Um, but anyway, but yes, um, mm. I guess like one of the recurring themes in my life is that like having a clear sense of like trying to like having not a clear sense, having at least a low resolution image of what I'm trying to get to is often what inspires that curiosity. And then as a, if I were just like point to the benefit of curiosity, I'd say like what reveals itself over time is the overlap and connections between whatever new discipline you're learning and all the things you're already doing. Right. So that's a huge shortcut that eventually um, makes itself apparent um, because what's important about the tools, what's important about the process and techniques and everything we use is often the purpose and the people that relate to applying the purpose. And it's not something that uh, like sometimes to have the confidence, we really hold on to, you know, like a comfort tool or a comfort approach. And, but like, you know, a little bit of curiosity over time can really accrue into this, a little bit more flexibility where you can find like, well, uh, th it'd be more important. Like d the shortcuts between, um, uh, let's see, willing to navigate conversations. Like you're working with someone who is the lead anchor on a thing and you're willing to take some other aspect of it because we're not going to meet the, the, the deadline. You have enough experience to recognize the problem on the horizon and enough uh, practice to put it into words that your collaborators can understand. And, you know, you're not managing the team, but you're, um, you're participating, you're invested, you're being your whole person that you're able to bring. 
to mm-hmm. that thing. And, and including this other skill where you're like, yeah, it's not my main role on the project, but I could help mm-hmm. or whatever. And depending on the nature of the team and the context like that, that can be a pretty huge um, uh, contribution and way to it, solve it, if, that problem you committed if, to. If I were to cap off what you just said too, is I'd say that is also the path to being indispensable, right? Like if you can be helpful in that many different ways, then like this, this, this goes to this whole scarcity mindset of like, I got to protect my turf. This is my thing. This is my aspect of my, my, this is my specialization. Don't come in here, you know? Um, and like part of it is like only I could do this well. Sure. Maybe. Um, but then, but then I, I also often hear a sense of protectivism of like, well, don't, don't take this away from me. This is my thing. And it's like, well, th- yeah, that's that's a way to be indispensable. But there's also a way to be indispensable is like being useful in a variety of situations and always helping everybody do a better job. Um, they're going to remember that. They're going to remember how it feels to be around that. And they're going to be like, well, why don't we just get this person to help? Because they always help us find solutions to this stuff. You know? Uh, yeah, I think that's really helpful where... It's not just saying like your only value comes out of your ability to be industrious and pleasant. Um, but like it's it's useful. Like you're part of that project. You probably care about it, I hope, right? You want yeah. to see it succeed. So like um, sometimes adapting a bit based on being comfortable with being curious and, you know, uh, willing, you know, comfortable enough with the... There's, cause there's, I guess we're talking about multiple, another uh, thing to be really more clear about is that the curiosity isn't just the, um, the navigating the new things and building the skills. It's, it could be um, putting them into practice in those new situations and uh, feeling confident enough to, to try with that, uh, which I, I thought that this is an interesting thing. I wanted to make sure we covered before we wrap this section up, which is, um, you brought in something into the notes that I think is, uh, I don't know why, but it really strikes me as a, as a powerful, helpful thing as someone who has a hard time defining themselves really quickly and easily in, in a lot of contexts, especially a general context, me, a generalist showing up to something that has a generalish feel to it. Don't know how to introduce myself, you know, welcome to the lean into art cast. <laughs> um, and, uh, but this idea of a portfolio career really yeah, it's a nice clarification where it's like, yeah, I, you know, the career made up of, of a bunch of different things, which one of the, the sources of those things can be this sort of curiosity as a practice and practicing some kind of systemic um, curiosity. But um, yeah, help, help me with uh, how you, your, your take on the building mm. a portfolio career. Well, yeah. Yeah. So like, I guess if I were to summarize it as like, but using myself as as a model a modeling exercise of this, like I have, I have three jobs essentially right now. You know, I say I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist. I should really amend that. Like I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and I'm a festival director, right? Because uh, that that is like right now, especially that's a major part of my life. Um, and so, well, is this you just like moonlighting all over the place, or are these things? Do they have any integration? And the thing that I've discovered is I found a path to an integrated portfolio career in the sense that the skills I develop in parallel between these three jobs all reinforce and build each other uh, across the, the disciplines. And I, 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 I personally think this has a lot to do with the, the practice and the um, system of curiosity that I've introduced into my development as an artist. And so like, I make comic books. That provides evidence to get me jobs teaching. Why do we want you to come in here and teach how to make comics? Well, I've been published by these different institutions that you know of. I have self-published books. I have a whole bunch of uh, these artifacts to show you that I've committed the time and the energy to achieve some sense of mastery at this thing to whatever level I have so that I can now, you know, pres- I have the credentials to, pre- the, uh, to show that I have the skills to, that I can transmit to these audiences, right? Um, and then my, the teaching, you know, well, teaching isn't just me telling people how to make comics. This is the way you do it. That's all. You just draw a figure this way, and they use these kind of ink pens, and then you put them the panels in this order, and then it's success. You know, it's, it's obviously it's more nuanced and complex 
than that. Otherwise, we would be experiencing a never-ending stream of best-selling books. Every book would be a best-selling book because there's so many YouTube videos on how to make comics, right? It, it's got to be more nuanced than that. So why? What else are you doing? Well, you're doing like personal com like uh, conflict resolution, um, meeting people where they are, perspective taking, which feeds into my project management work as an event organizer, right? <laughs> and then my work as an event organizer teaches me more about the comics landscape, which informs me in terms of choices that I have for project choice in, in, in investigating different avenues of where I could... Uh, pitch projects, people people of influence in the industry, um, trends in the industry, things like that. So all of these things are like, it's it's an ecosystem. It's not three diver, uh, silos. I feel this, <laughs> and I appreciate you sharing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So it, it, it's it's like that. Sometimes I, I the reason I want to do this episode is because like sometimes because I've been doing this so long, I feel like the overlap of things is utterly obvious. It's written in ten foot tall letters on every building I walk by, right? And then I forget that oh, that's because I've practiced this for literally two decades. Um, maybe it's worth digging back in and talking about it from a more fundamental perspective for people who don't look at this that way all the time. Um, I'm not prescribing a way of life. I'm just describing how a system of thought and approach has benefited me in, in really substantial ways throughout my life. Um, not just in terms of personal enrichment, like in terms of like, well, I got more money now and I'm more influential. I've got like, you know, a career or whatever. Eh, yeah. But also just like, it feels really good to... It's like, it's like, I guess I would say it's like, um, it's kind of like when you see Obi-Wan Kenobi do like the Jedi mind trick for the first time. You're like, oh, that would be so amazing to be able to do that. I'm not saying that I can do that, but I'm saying that like it sometimes seeing the connections to things feels like that, that effortless, that little hand wave is like, oh yeah, there it is. And then I see other people not see that. I'm like, oh yeah, it feels really good to like just intuit it sometimes. Right. It does feel good. And then. Uh, where, but what's tough is that just you having that uh, recognition doesn't share the power. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> in order to 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 share that, so the group can all come together and make that project happen, make that product do, make that service, you know, whatever it is, it it's like um, another level of of. Um, the curiosity is, I suppose it could be directed internally. It could be directed at a, at the, the thing or the skill, but, and it could be directed at that moment where it may be of use, but it also can be directed to, you know, connecting with those others who may or may not be recognizing that. And not to say that just because you feel that feeling doesn't mean then you, they don't, that is now law for some group of people you work with. It's that um, you can, finding ways to tell that story and involve others in that collaborative endeavor is, is another, is, I don't know, it's another element of, of the, um, putting the, putting the skills and the curiosity to use. I, I, um, yeah, I'm sure it's, you're it's like, how might you see that? How might you see that? How might, yeah. And, and, and the other thing that I think is like, totally not a spoiler for anybody who's listened to lean and tart for any amount of time is we are so not interested in like protecting the power the power is everybody's power right and like like when i when i start noticing that people oh you don't see that well here let me help you see that more easily um and also and here's here's where it gets selfish again this is where the, this stuff is like a cycle this is not a one-way transmission is like hmm. by me hearing how you see that i'm gonna level up at how i see that Right. But this, there was this moment in my classroom where it wasn't actually, it was actually at a workshop and like this student was helping me understand something. I forget exactly what it was, but it was this moment where like I presented the, the information and my perspective, my approach on it. I'm like, yeah, but what about if you did it this way? And I'm like, 
yeah, what if we did it that way? And then we started talking it through. And then the the hosting organization, the representative was like, who's teaching who here? <laughs> Cross their arms and like, well, yeah, this is the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> you know, like th- this is this is actually you're witnessing like the, the most healthy cycle of a classroom experience right now. You know, so. Uh, how interesting, though, too. Like, yeah, and and that example contains both perspectives as far as uh, the both the the most the the two extremes of curiosity, saying, you know, <laughs> there's the safe way, and then the scary way, and other people are like, well, this isn't scary. This is this is where all the good magic happens, and uh, yeah, yeah. How how interesting. So what a what a fun topic, and um, like, is there I suppose we're, we, we're not going to do a final thought on this one too. So no, we're going to, we're going to, going to go into the two minute practice. Two minute practice. There, I, there's, yeah. I don't think there's like a clean place to close on this. Cause I feel like this is something that's pretty fundamental to who we are as people, right? This is something we're talking about something that's like really like coded in our DNA at this point. It wasn't, I, I don't want to say it was always there, right? This is something that was much more nascent when I was 22, 21. And it's something that I spent a long time, nurturing and developing into like now it's like almost a habit uh and and it's but i say almost because i'm not always awesome at it i'm there are plenty of times where like i get defensive i get afraid i get nervous i get flop sweats and i'm not in the moment and i don't think as collaboratively and I, i'm not as curious and that's where there's so many dimensions to the curiosity too, because for me early in my career, I needed to level up in the people thing because I, in my janitorial career, I went from individual contributor to a supervisor, to a manager, to then like this general troubleshooter managing a few different accounts and stuff like that. And I did a ton of teaching. I did a ton of, um, I was reading this, a book that was new at the time, newish, uh, seven habits of uh, the seven habits of highly effective people. I actually wrote an article about this. I'll try to um, give you the link for the show notes or what have you. But like I shared, like that was when I first got into this idea, reflecting back now of how of of essentially user systemic minded user centered design, um, because you know like the, those different principles uh, have a lot of utility. You principles themselves have a lot of utility, and like uh, it's taken me a long time in my career to be able to speak conversantly about that entire gamut of topics but um but like there's this uh i guess yeah it's a slow accruing um thing that uh i don't know i think i think it benefits whether you're whether you know whether you like the 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 finding the general things, doing the independent stuff, using it to help you build new businesses and endeavors, take on the bigger picture stuff of making organizations, or if it's, or if it's, you know, focusing on a particular role. I mean, it's, you know, the systemic curiosity has a lot of benefit to, um, to its practice and putting it to use. I think you found a good summary. That's great. All right. Well, do you want to take one more break and then come back and do the two minute practice? We're going to make some noise, everybody. We're going to make some noises, not with our mouths, um, in about a minute and a half to two minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Two minute practice. We get to follow up on what we've been working on for a couple of weeks, which yeah. I kind of like that as a cycle, but anyway. <laughs> um, Maybe we should switch to that. All right. Well, we'll come back and talk about that in a couple minutes. First, we got to thank some more people who make the show possible. And those people happen to be us. We make the show possible. We make lots of things and we think hard about the things we make. We are very curious when we're developing these things and we bring the reflections and thoughts and experiences to this project called Lean Into Art. The thing that I make that I hope you will check out that is not Lean Into Art right now is the 4 Million Years Later podcast. Yes, it's another podcast, but this is another project that really demonstrates like how I am showing up on a weekly basis to practice curiosity with a friend. And me and my buddy Hoover love the Transformers cartoon. We've been talking about it on the phone for 25 years. And we've decided to start collecting those conversations as a podcast where we rewatch the episodes in a more intentional and thoughtful way and really examine, like try to, try to come to some kind of conclusion as to what is it about this series that, that has so gripped us for so long. And the latest episode is episode 34 called Microbots. And this one is... I mean, if you really like it when I dig into 
analysis, this is one to check out because the, pr the plot is that the Autobots shrink themselves down to microscopic size to invade Megatron's body to stop him from doing something really heinous. And uh, when they go inside his body, Megatron's a gray, angular robot, but they get inside and it's all like weird Salvador Dali, surrealistic, multicolorful, nightmarish. His thoughts are these weird purple electric serpents that fly around. And I, I go off on a jag about how like this is the underworld story. This is the hero going into the underworld to come out transformed, so to speak. And, you know, we think it's about just a, a story about shrinking and growing, but no, it's much more than that. And also for the people who like this kind of thing, the Decepticons literally get drunk in this episode. They drink too much Energon and they start stumbling around and slurring their speech. Yes, they did that in the Transformers cartoon. So that's at 4millionyearslater.com, episode 34, Microbots. Uh, and if you enjoy it, please give it a review and, uh, you know, join us on the Facebook page if you want to comment on some past episodes. Rob, you have a store. I do have a store and uh, I do a variety of things related to um, coaching, creative process coaching for, you know, choosing a career path, starting user experience as a system in your organization, or if you as an individual or your team are working on developing a new product, I've got a product practice lab to help you get those things um, out into, out of your head and into the world. But one product I want to highlight right now is something that I worked, um, I've been working on for well, about 10 years. It's the video game Guitar Fretter. So go to guitarfretter.com to learn more about this thing that is, it's all about making it um, like a fun action game to like, it's an arcade in, inspired action game to learn the note positions on a guitar fretboard. And that, uh, Oh, we're having some hosting quirks with guitarfretter.com. Yeah, I guess so. So go to, um, all right, if that's, I'll have to look into what's going on there with the DNS for that website. Speaking of curiosity and wearing multiple hats. <laughs> so um, an easier thing to do then for right now, or if there if there's issues with that, go to um, robstenzinger.itch.io mm. and you'll see a link to Guitar Fretter right there. Okay. And so the, and, and it links to all the platforms, even on the itch.io site. So you can get it for Windows, you can get it for Mac and iOS and for Android. Um robstenziger.itch.io. Oh, wait, um, no. I put slash itch.io. Sorry about that, Rob. Oh, no problem. There it's um anyway, yeah. So we're having some fun video backing backing <laughs> up the, the ad copy. Um, <laughs> sorry. That so <laughs> guitar fretter is not <laughs> a you know, not found page 404. It's uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a whole, again, it's an arcade game where you can, you can uh, practice with uh six and seven string guitar, four and five string bass. And uh, there you go. It's, it, it encourages memorization of those note, of note positions on the guitar fretboard. So check it out at robstenzinger.itch.io. And then there'll be a link right there to guitar fretter. And the other thing we'll hope you'll check out is the Lean Into Art Discord. We have a forum now where you can interact with us uh, in a time-shifted manner, just like in the old days of the PHP BB forum, since we're talking about old days this week. Um, and the invite link will be in this episode and in every episode. There, is, there are three or four public channels where you know anybody can just join and join the conversation. But then there's also a special section for people who support us on Patreon where you can uh, access the, the Lean Into Art Brain Trust, share some work in progress, get some... Uh, thoughts, questions, and wonderings about the work that you're trying to develop. And then also a social channel where you can just share about like, hey, this is this is a pretty great place to get a hot dog. Uh, once again, the link will be in the show notes. Thanks to everybody who's been hanging out with us in the Discord. It's been fun getting to know all of you a little bit more. Yeah, right on. It's a good, good thing. I like that Discord. So what is happening next? Two-minute practice. Hey, Jersey. Hi, Rob. It is time for the two-minute practice. And what were we practicing this last couple of weeks? Uh, so we had one of those, uh, like, hopefully classics, um, like, easy path forward ones where it's about, you know, picking up an instrument and making some noise. Um, then there you go. You set a two minute timer. See what happens. Give it a few tries. And uh, so how did this practice go for you? Well, it's been a, a wild couple of weeks for me, so I didn't get to do it a whole lot, but I was grateful for the excuse to do it because 
one of the things that I have said to myself repeatedly over the last two years is, I want a hobby, Rob. I want a hobby so bad. Um, I want to be able to do something, explore with curiosity for no purpose other than the act of doing it, right? Uh, in this week's Leaning Smart Cast, we spend a lot of time talking about curiosity and how it benefits all of our other work that we do. But there's also just something that's just pleasurable about exploring something for its own sake. And for me, one thing that I've always wanted to do well, or like well enough that I can call it a hobby, is music. Um, music has been an elusive topic to me for a long time. Um, and, and, and like dancing, like, I don't know, I don't know about you, but like dancing makes almost no sense to me. Like I love watching it. Like Fred Astaire, it's, it's, it's mesmerizing how that man can move. But then when somebody tries to explain the concept to me, it's like, you're trying to explain it to like data on Star Trek. I'm like, so I move my body to the rhythm, but what, what rhythm, what am I listening for? And how do I move it? You know? <laughs> so like, I've never been awesome at it and I've never uh, like really enjoyed it. And so I feel like I need to heal my relationship with music. Mm. Now I have this, I've had this instrument for um, going on 20 years now and it's been sitting in a case. I pull it out occasionally. I mess around with it. And then I go like, ah, oh, this is, this is hard. And I got to put it away. Um, and also like, this, this is me being a little vulnerable on screen and on audio is that, yes, I know the implications of a Gen Xer who loved comic books and Weird Al Yankovic owning an accordion. What, what does it mean? <laughs> What does it mean? Well, <laughs> it's called a cliche. <laughs> a cliche. Dude, I like shorts with flames on them, <laughs> spicy things, heavy metal, <laughs> and BMX bikes, skateboards. Uh, yeah. Uh, and playing guitar. Okay. So, yeah. Touche. And I yeah. have long hair. So I'm we're we're um we're like a um we're we're two member Gen X um cliche squad. <laughs> Here's our theme song. <laughs> Goes a little bit like this. Hey. We're picking up some of it on the mic. There's a lot oh. of drop off. Oh yeah, because it's not close to the mic. You've got some close action on the mic. Oh. Your mic, yeah, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to, gonna have to stand up with that accordion and blast the mic with it. Really? Oh man. Okay. Well, this. here we go. Yeah. Oh. oh man. See, I don't know what I'm doing. So there Sweet. we go. So I. So what? The, yeah. yeah. How did that go? Like, so did you teach yourself that this, you know? I don't know. I was just, I was just, or? I was just goofing around there. I, no, I, 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 I was, <laughs> I could be in a punk band. No, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I just played around and made some noises. I, I was trying to, because I only got to do a few sessions and because it's been kind of like a packed couple of weeks for me, um, I didn't get to arrive at playing any like sequence of notes that are from a thing that was like one of the things i was trying to do is like okay here, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna further put myself on blast i was trying to play the transor z theme song on my accordion <laughs> 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 and, and so i i got a few like you know a couple of rhythms into it but just you know it's i didn't have enough time to really play it so uh what was my experience? My experience was is a sense of longing and wishing mm. to be able to make time to do this more, um, and 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 feeling a real commitment to like yeah after October like I really want to put in like a half hour a week. That's not a lot to ask, and I know that that skill will accrue over time, and at least I'll have the pleasure of listening to this this instrument that I love. Like I have a lot of, also, you know, like for, for the perspective, like another reason I have an accordion is that, you know, when I was growing up, polka fests were like a big part of my life. I have a very Polish family. Um, I'm first generation oh. American. So like uh, there's a town in Michigan called Frankenmuth where they would have these, you know, Oktoberfest was like a big deal there. And uh, yeah, we go every, every fall. And uh, so like pol polka music, Myron Florin, Marv Herzog was like a part of a, the, the, the soundtrack of my childhood. So I have, a, it's not just because like Weird Al Yankovic sings about food, but it's like, this is, you know, 
This, this, this sound feels like, it just makes me feel like, oh, it's the holidays. Oh, yeah, that, um, I've been to a fair amount of um, German festivals and, you know, especially Oktoberfest celebrations and having a polka band or been to plenty of weddings where, yeah, the, it's, a, it's a polka band. And um, that's... Which, uh, which is the original ska. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, yeah, there's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a really, it's such a robust, full, it's, 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 it's like a hootie honking, big, robust in- instrument. Yeah, it is and, too, uh, right? Like that's the other part of it. It's it's just so darn big. It like it it's it says to you, it's like, you want to play me? You serious? You really serious about this? <laughs> better, I weigh thirty pounds. You better get ready to hug a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there there was my experience this week with the practice. What about you, Rob? Well, okay. So, I've I mean, so as a teenager, and you know. What's funny? So, like during the similar time, like I talked about during the the Lean Into Art cast, I, I that was probably one of my last bands I was in. Um, I had like a studio music project, you know, when I was right around thirty. But um, but yeah, early twenties, I, I you know we get together and jam and stuff, and and I thought, oh, this could be a creative endeavor that becomes a business. Who knows? And you know, so I just I would would dabble with with that kind of thing playing the role of a guitarist whether it be rhythm or or you know uh maybe lead in a, you know four or five piece band uh rock band but yeah you know it's it's uh i there was always other stuff going on and never i there's my my skills i have you know I would like to do a lot more development with my skills, but it is certainly a hobby. I certainly have stuck with it for a long time. And I made a video game to get better at knowing what the heck the note positions are on That's the guitar true, fretboard, yeah. which, you know, I'm thankful other people find useful too. Um, but I picked up, I picked up a variety of instruments. I played my drums for a session. Mm. Um, electronic drum kit, whatever I'm a, that's probably my weakest instrument. Uh, but through the, you know, through, turning stuff into practical music the if you know practicing like a digital audio workstation like garage band or logic and stuff like that like a little bit like doing something wrong 50 times but getting it right the 51st time or the 32nd time somewhere in there uh you can take many takes and find you know all of a sudden it's like hey i had a competent take Woohoo! <laughs> my timing was what was decent and guess what? You're going to loop. Boom. Look at that. I'm looping confidence. There you go. And so I had, I, I use techniques like that to like make songs and stuff here and there. And, and it is, people might say it's cheating. Okay, fine. But um, I find it pragmatic and um, I do use, use the tools, but uh, I have my, my, um, uh, oh, it's a, uh, this is, it's not a uh, soprano. Ook, it's a, um, it's the uh, why am I blanking on the the type of ukulele? Because because instead of starting with the C and the higher one that you see a lot of folks play a typical ukulele, it's a um um uh, it's it's goes the, the low string is goes D G B E, and um, can you hear that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I um all right. Uh, let's see. I happen to have another another mic nearby, so I'm able to sort of mic the guitar and stuff. Look which I, I plan that while you were playing accordion so wow um there's a um there's a i'm just gonna play a thing so that's just a little relaxing uh i which i started learning the tetris theme song observation anyway, observation um, everything sounds more poignant when you play it on an ukulele like like i noticed that like this is like amanda palmer has like kind of like been doing this as like a whole genre where i'm just gonna take like a a, a 
popular, well-known piece of music, and I'm going to play it on a ukulele and sing it softly. And I was like, and, and the thought occurred to me, is like, is anybody doing this with like Motorhead or, you know, Quiet Riot or like, like, like a really raunchy, like qu- Quiet Riot song? I wonder if you could make it into something poignant, like Slick Black Cadillac on the ukulele. <laughs> Hmm. I don't know, playing around. I uh, what was that Blur song too? But oh yeah, Ooh. yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like something that it feels like really driving yeah, and aggressive, and like it just makes it more. It feels wiser when it's played on ukulele. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> it feels wiser. Um, it's it, it's an approachable. Um, stringed instrument and, and um i i am a, a quirky dude where i just really enjoyed electric guitar and only electric for a long time but eventually mm. got an acoustic and then you know years late not not that many years ago felt you know hey why not start to visit the the ukuleles and stuff like that which is a makes it a good possibility that Guitar Fritter Deluxe may have some ukulele in it, but mm. yeah. And uh, so, so why do it? Whatever. So I have a lot of expectations. Like I want to be able to, to make music. I, um, another thing I did too, I noodled around with uh, a couple practices was actually loading up um, uh, garage band. Okay. Hello, face ID. Um, and so I'm garage band uh, the, in, on your iOS devices. Nice. It's, um, there's a lot of interesting tools in there where you can, uh, you know, just use a little bit of sense of little bit of sense of pitch, pitch and rhythm. And, um, so here you go. There's this, um, it's a type of, um, semi-automated piano, um, which you can choose from like, um, I can get rid of the, the um, arpeggiation, right? So arpeggiation is just sort of stepping through um, tones in a certain pattern, which could be, you know, in a scale or not or whatever, but um, whoops, let's see. Yeah, it's got a funky UI, but the, the um, let's see, how do I get back to, uh, get back to, okay. So then, so that was, there was a, uh, a, a UI that was, um, you know, focused on arpeggios, but then this is the one that's focused on chords. So turn this up. Do you, you have an accompaniment? So somewhere's the so there's um there's a different modes of, of like you can have like a um, a digital screen equivalent of a of a piano. But then you could actually, you know, turn that into a variety of, of different um, uh, sort of automations to, to, um, to adjust the, the behavior. You know, like, so, of course, there's a, there's a regular piano keyboard. And then different, you know, there's more. This is a more of a synth. And there's all these adjustments and stuff. So it's, it was fun just to play around with GarageBand for a few minutes at a time. And, um, you know, like... Uh, I don't know. Are you familiar with GarageBand on iOS? Oh, it's been years since I played with it, but yeah. Okay, cool. Like, so, I mean, they even have like drum kits where it was, it was funny where there was a certain time where, you know, speaking of being curious and trying different things, um, uh, one of my bands, like early bands in, um, you know, high school, I, it was pretty much me and a drummer. Hmm. And, um, for a lot of it. And for a short lived while we, we were more than that, but so you have, uh, so I, I would learn like, like it was, it's like, what's this instrument about? Right. Anyway. And like, here's a, you know, here you are in a kit, like the UI is, is, um, mm-hmm. you're looking at a drum kit, a drum kit. Yeah. yeah as so if you're sitting behind interface. it. Yeah. So you can, um, just sort of act out your drum knowledge with as many fingers as you can manage, you know, hitting the, hitting the, um, those little pictures of, of drums. But, uh, but it's a very like, um, garage band is a really flexible, approachable, um, workstation to, to, um, 
to develop ideas of music. So for instance, like loops for, um, let's see what, uh, loops for, oh, um, the underwater tomato ninja game. I made that fully in garage band, hmm. um, stuff like that. And the, if you go to uh, gameconstructionkit.com, you can find the open source project that all those assets are, you know, are, are available. But, um, yeah, anyway, so the, my experience was sort of just connecting with, um, I enjoy this hobby very much and I want to, um, just have it be more frequent that I play, play mm -hmm. in that space. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's just so many great tools and things where it's like, if you, if you're playing in the space, you're feeling conversant enough and you, you think like, Oh, I'm sort of creating a mine of things to, to dig into and make use of later on. Um, once you feel that comfortable, then you can do stuff like if you have iOS, you, you just record it on anything and then bring it into your digital audio workstation later. But um, there is an interesting app called um, Music Memos on iOS. Hmm. It's kind of nice. It has a natural path from it to GarageBand. And it'll even fake. Like if you're, if, you're, if you're humming or singing or if you're playing something on one instrument, it will bring in auto accompaniment as it tries to pitch detect and rhythm. Um, Holy detect. cow. Yeah. It's kind of neat. Okay. That, that's like, that's, that's 21st century future stuff. <laughs> And in a way, you're sort of using this as a as a robot collaborator where you're like, you know, I don't like that rhythm, but it gives me an idea. Mm -hmm, and you mm -hmm. can just keep on playing. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, I, I, I guess you're you're echoing the part of what you're saying is echoing what I experienced this week is that it's uh it's nice to re-engage with something that is is I have no objective for. It, it's pure play. Uh, I don't get to do that very much. Um, and even even when I think about play, like I think about video games, you know, like oh, there's rumors that are happening all the time. Metroid Prime 4 is coming. I'm like, oh, I, I got to brace myself when that happens. Um, but that too, there's like an objective in that. There's something to accomplish, right? When I was playing with my accordion, it's like, there's no objective here. This is me just like enjoying the experience of holding this massively heavy thing on my lap and making noises that make me feel happy. Um, you know, uh, and yes, I want to get better at expressing my ideas in that way, because I also think that like, I'm going to, there's unforeseen benefit in me thinking musically, I'm sure I, there's, there's known unknowns in that territory. Right. Um, but that's not the point. The point is just to experience the play that like, and, and I really enjoyed that aspect of this practice. Hmm. That's, it's really neat. And I have, um, I, I just have, I have sort of, there's different voices in my head about music and I like to try to listen to them at the right times as far as just having fun voice, as far as no, be intentional and try to get better at this voice. And then, you know, Hey, whether you're being, you know, having fun or being intentional that you could turn this into something voice. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I, I know that everyone. Uh, <laughs> that 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 persona is is hardwired into me and that that character likes to come out all the time you know like every october that character rears his whatever whatever we want to call that face um yeah and i know that yeah that part of the fun will be augmented through skill acquisition too i'll have more fun if i know what i'm doing right so like these things are not separate things right but it was it was nice to engage with it primarily in that spirit of play. Uh, I don't get to do that as much as I would like. So um, what do you want to do this next week or two weeks? All right. Well, let's see what, yeah. What would make sense to do next? Like, yeah, just two minutes, do some exploring. Um, hmm. What would be, I'm going to say the, the I'm going to throw business into it, into this. Mm. It's time to, Time to get bring in business practice. All right. Best practice. <laughs> um, no, not that. Just practice practice. Um, is there something? Let's, okay. So th I'm exploring this, this food, food for thought. I'm looking for your reaction to help shape what this practice could be, right? Um, whether it's one that you think would be good to, to try for yourself or not. But 
So taking a look at uh, the pages you use to present your stuff online, whether it's you and your portfolio or it's you have products, uh, you know, take a look at that with fresh eyes and let's see. I wonder, so part of me is thinking like, I don't want you to try to usability test it on yourself. You should do that with someone else who actually has fresh eyes. But um, so take a look at it and, and think, how could it be simpler? And, you know, where it's less words or, hmm. um, and, and not in the hardcore reductive, it sounds useful to say this kind of thing. Like, I do not want, I don't even want to say the thing I don't want to say. To be specific, but like, I don't mean saying reduce all the clicks or that kind of thing. Cause the right amount of clicks it's about, um, so there's a principle in, in, um, experience design, interactive design called, uh, progressive disclosure. So you think about the thing you're sharing, sharing the right amount and helping people go further, right? Progressively, this, you disclose more as they go further in what's that right amount? And so taking a look at what you're presenting, uh, uh, you know, as your product or business stuff and thinking, you know, is, is this the right amount? Cause honestly, I guess maybe that's a better question because maybe it's, maybe there's a lot to filter and it could be simpler, but, or maybe there's not enough. So is there enough to have, uh, to let someone dive into what you're sharing? Mm -hmm. From a storytelling sense. standpoint, this is where there's dramatic reveals down the road. You reveal just enough about the character to get to know and appreciate and, and want something for them. And then you find out that the reason that they want this thing in the first place is because of something that happened with their aunt five years ago, right? That's mm. progressive, progressive disclosure, right? Yeah. Totally. Uh, and, and, and another thing that I do with when I'm, when I'm writing is I'll try to sort of like blast a bunch of information into a document and then look at it again and go like, what are, what's the three things I'm trying to say here? Right? Like what are the three big ideas in, in there? And then I can, if I can extract those, then I know what can go away. Right? Like what's, what's ancillary information. So what I'm curious, what I'm excited to do is look at my, um, hire me to teach a workshop page on my website at, which I haven't touched in like a decade and do that. Right. Can I clarify this? Right. That's great. Yeah. I mean, you know, picking that thing, cause I mean, it's something that once it's out in the world, there's often, you know, bigger things to take care of, if, but this would be the practice of how do you continue to refine how you share your products with the world? The idea, this would be the merchandising aspect. So yep. you have That's the making great. it, you got the marketing of it. So people are aware of it, but the merchandising means it's being presented in a way so people can act on it. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. No, that's good. Uh, okay. So, and if we do two weeks, that's 20 minutes. If we only work on weekdays, if we only practice on weekdays. Hmm. So that's 20 minutes of work on your, not bad. On your merchandising. Want to do that? Uh, yeah, let's do that. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see right. everybody join us in two weeks to report in on how you feel about spending 20 minutes, uh, accumulative, accumulatively, trying to clarify some aspect of your, the business end of your business end. Oh, the business aspect, the merchandising aspect of the art that you make, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Jersey. I guess that we have done another podcast. So, uh, this is a fun one. This, this felt like a, uh, one that was very near and dear to both our hearts. And, uh, I hope it was interesting or, uh, hopefully useful to anybody who's listening in. If you want to chime in about it, there's the comments channel on the Lean Into Art Discord. We'd love to hear from you. So uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of the Lean Into Art cast. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of LeanIntoArt.com, Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of LeanIntoArt.com and Rob Stenzinger places like Instagram. Okay, bye. <laughs> Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart 
at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.